So tonight we've been talking about making ways and how people can have an impact on the rest of the world. Now, as an engineering student here at Cal Poly, the first thing I think of when I think of making waves is, is innovation, technology, and progress. It's the sort of innovative thinking that gets students involved with engineering in the first place. And so my background is in mechanical engineering, and I'm now pursuing a master's degree in fire protection engineering here at Cal Poly. And the longer I'm in the field of engineering, the more I find myself inspired by innovation and progress in the world around me. So there's no doubt in my mind that progress and innovation make waves. They have impacts that are felt on all sides of the world. But not all of these waves, not all these impacts felt on all sides of the world are inherently good. So tonight I want to talk a little bit about the unintended consequences, these unforeseen waves that are generated from progress. And I want to start our discussion with where the United States gets our electricity from. And there's a question I asked some of my friends and colleagues here on campus, and not everyone has a good answer for this, but when you plug your phone into a wall outlet, where is that power coming from? What is the origin of the electricity? And honestly, the most consistent response I'll get is pg and &E. I don't know. Which, I mean, they're not wrong to a certain extent, but that doesn't answer the question of where did that energy originate? And so I have a breakdown for you. So this, is a this figure is taken from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. It speaks to the nation for the year 2017, and it speaks to the entire U.S. And what surprises some people is the majority of our energy, or the majority of our electricity generated, comes from burning fossil fuels. And this doesn't come as a surprise to everyone, but over 60% of our energy generated in 2017 came from burning coal and natural gas. And so there's this bit of a misconception sometimes that when we plug in something or we go to our wall outlet, that energy just sort of appears. But the reality is it has to come from something. And so as a society, we try to conserve this energy. And that's sort of twofold. One, in one sense, we're trying to conserve the limited resources we have. And in the other sense, we're trying to limit our effects on the environment, for example. But regardless, we conserve our energy. But as people, we also like to be comfortable. So one way we facilitate this is we expend a lot of energy conditioning the space that we occupy. Uh, when it's cold outside, we heat the air in our buildings. When it's hot outside, we cool the air in our buildings. But all of this takes energy. And energy doesn't come from nothing. If you think about a building, too, any building, um, they're inherently leaky. And what I mean by this is if you put air in a building, it's going to find a way out. And so whether that's through the walls, the roof, the window, so on and so forth, air finds a way out of the building. And so if we're investing energy to condition this air that we put in this space, then it's escaping. We're wasting that energy. So in the 70s, there was a big push to create more airtight and energy efficient buildings. But in doing so, as the 80s rolled around, we began to go to work in these tight construction buildings, which were more energy efficient. But people began to feel sick. And then they go home and they feel better. So what's going on there? And it's this idea that when we built to tighter construction standards, when we used more insulation, we kept this air circulating around in the building for longer, which is what we wanted, saves energy, but you start to build up contaminants, pollen, mold, bacteria, all build up in that space, and they cause the occupants to feel nausea, headaches, other flu-like symptoms. So this became known as the sick building syndrome. And when they went home, they'd feel better because these build their homes were not necessarily built to such tight standards. So there was fresh air still flowing into the, into the building, and there wasn't a high level of contaminants. And so uh, the World Health Organization recognized the sick building syndrome in the mid-'80s and uh, began to recognize that this is an international issue that had to do with the air quality within the buildings. Now, luckily, there was a fairly straightforward solution to this, and people began to specify outside air requirements to our ventilation systems, which essentially all we're saying is, we're designing a ventilation system for a building. We're going to incorporate a certain amount of fresh air to flow into the building and produce this buildup of contaminants. And this was in addition to filtration and better systems for monitoring the contaminants, but the problem went away. Now let's take a quick step back and look at the intent here. What was the intention of the tighter construction standards? And the intention was good. The intention was energy conservation, the idea of being wiser with our limited resources. But it came with an unforeseen wave. It came with a negative consequence that we didn't see coming. Now, we were, able, we were able to get through that, and we moved on. But do you think we get to today, and we haven't sorted out all of these unintended consequences or all these unforeseen issues that have to do with energy conservation in our buildings? So lately, designers have been incorporating what we call aluminum composite materials, or ACMs. And the way these work, it's an insulative material that, in, at the core, is a low density, generally a foam plastic of some sort, or layers of insulation, and then it's sandwiched in between two aluminum sheets. And the way this entire panel works is you'd install this on the facade or the exterior of a building, and it would help to reduce your energy costs, and it would insulate the building. 
Uh, the problem with this is while it makes a great insulator, that low density, generally foam plastic core on the inside, is oftentimes flammable. So do we see an issue with lining, say, a high-rise building with material like this? And looking at it holistically, it should be non-combustible. It shouldn't catch fire because there's that aluminum composite panel on the outside. But what if fire, for example, was to penetrate into the composite and ignite the flammable insulation inside? So on June 14th, 2017, a fire broke out in the Grenfell Tower, which was a 24-story residential high-rise building in London. And the facade of Grenfell was constructed with these similar composite insulative panels. And it's not the only building that was installed with these. These have been used around the world because they're durable, cheap, and, and aesthetically pleasing, so designers love them. But a fire broke out in Grenfell, and eventually the fire broke outside and ignited the facade. So because of the flammable nature of this insulative material, the fire began to jump from floor to floor, and eventually the entire building was engulfed in flames. Now, 72 people lost their lives that day. And this became the worst residential fire in the history of the UK since World War II. So Grenfell in itself deserves at least an hour to discuss the, the, the issues that led up to this as a problem, but it's also not the only fire like this to occur. Facade fires related to this low-density combustible material have been occurring around the world in the last few years. Dozens. There were times when we were hearing about these once a month, and they all had to do with this flammable insulation we're putting on our buildings for the sake of energy conservation. Now, it begs the question, I mean, at what point, like, why are we putting this on our buildings? And we have to take a step back and think about what was the intent here? The intent was good. The intent was to conserve our limited resources, conserve energy. But there came, just like the sick building syndrome, there came a negative consequence. There was an unintended wave that came with this push for innovation. And for this, and conveniently, there is some good work going on in the world of fire protection engineering and fire research, and we're hoping to mitigate this risk as we move forward. But I'm, not, I'm talking about energy conservation not because energy conservation is a field that I feel is inherently wrought with these unintended consequences, but it's because it's a, it's a field that we need. It's something that's needed in this world. And I want to say to anybody here who's dedicating their education or careers to sustainability and renewable resources or what have you, I applaud you. I think that is work that we need more than ever in this world. But unfortunately, our push for progress, our push for innovation and certain solutions have left unintended consequences behind it. So moving forward, I want to think of progress and innovation as a boat moving through the water. This idea that as we push forward, as a boat moves through the water, it creates waves, but it also creates something behind it. It creates a wake. And in this wake are all of our unforeseen consequences, all these unintended circumstances that occur from progress. And the harder we push, the faster the boat goes, the bigger the wake. And in the same sense, as we're sitting in the boat and we're moving in the direction of progress, we're oftentimes not looking back at the wake. We're sometimes not even acknowledging that we're creating it. So what do we do with this image moving forward? And one solution is to stop progress. The idea that if you stop the boat, you stop the wake. Sure. That's not the answer. Instead, we must better share our expertise with one another. And what I mean by that is innovative solutions at its core, does that need a diverse background of knowledge. And oftentimes, as specialized individuals in our own fields, we lack the insight, we lack the scope to appreciate all of the unintended consequences that might come from our actions. So if we as professionals can appreciate our lack of scope and appreciate and acknowledge the input of others, we begin to create more innovative and inclusive solutions. So think about any major construction, creating a building. You have the expertise ranging from finance and marketing all the way to the various disciplines of engineering and construction. Now, all of these people are an equal part of the project. And the optimum design, the optimum solution to a problem comes when everyone's at the table. So it's not the responsibility of the engineer, or the architect, or the scientist to come up with these unintended consequences and prevent them. They're not the only ones that should be looking for the wake. In the same sense that unintended consequences don't come in other fields besides energy conservation and fire science, every step of progress, in any capacity, in any discipline, has the, in, has the intent or the, the possibility of unintended consequences coming. Now the question is, are we looking for them? Are we aware of this wake that we're generating behind us, or is it just passing us by? Are we asking the hard questions when we're at the table, or are we at least bringing the right people to the table to ask the questions we don't have the insight for? And moving forward, it's the responsibility of all of us. And that starts with understanding where our power comes from. 
understanding our dependency on it. Adequately questioning the steps of progress, but not stifling innovation, but regulating, keeping an eye on the wake as we move forward. It also comes with creating a design that, or acknowledging that the best design isn't always the cheapest and isn't always the easiest. And it also comes with coming to a conference like this. I'm going to diverge here just for a moment, but I, I've been able to inter meet these speakers over the last couple of days, and I have to say that while we come from such a diverse background of, of experience and, and expertise, I love how our underlying message is the same, that all of us agree people make waves in this world. And we're thrilled to see it. All of us are excited to see progress and innovation move forward. And the reality is that we won't see every consequence coming on the horizon. We won't be able to see the wake every time, and no matter how careful we are. But if we are inclusive with one another, if we share our expertise better, then at least we can try to mitigate the damage left in the wake of progress. Thank you very much.